the impetus of this discussion came about because um, uh, we are build. We have a guy that builds our libraries. His name is Brian. He does a great job, um, and what he does. It's not that Brian, by the way. And. Uh, and, and basically, you say, okay, we got an RGB LED. So there we go, three channels, very good. And then, oh, now there's an angle one. RGB W, or RGB A. RGB A W. And then ETC came out with the desire, and there's seven chips. Or Celebrate first came out with the seven chip system. And it just became really complicated to control color without pan tilt, without strobing, without anything else. And uh, we ended up doing a lot of tech support, telling people, well, this, this might be the way you should do it. Or so we would suggest you run it in this mode or that mode. And uh, it just ended up uh, being such a process of bringing customers through this new technology that I ended up writing a paper on it. Um, and if you get the protocol from Plaza, um, uh, the article was actually published in this summer's edition of Protocol. Um, and it's a shame because I went to the office yesterday and waiting for me was a package of 10 protocols I could have brought them. But, um, but yeah, the paper went around a bit and I have to thank uh, Mr. Cloutier there because he uh, actually approved it for me before we, uh, we sent it out because he's a very uh, typical uh, customer who is dealing with selling these products and explaining to people, uh, you know, in layman's term, what it is. So, and it was Van who came up with the description uh, because I probably had some geeky description of what it means to mix color with LEDs. And he said, well, really what you're saying, Robert, is it's just not as easy as changing a gel. And, uh, and for the next 60 minutes or so, I'm going to explain to you why we think it may not be that easy. Um, so, the first thing, uh, and I said it at breakfast this morning, is LEDs are not going away. They're not a fad. You know, they're here to stay, and there's legislation that makes sure that we use them. And um, if, you, uh, if you're on Facebook, there's a great campaign called Save Tungsten. Um, and in all the European factories that build tungsten lamps are being forced to shut down, have been forced to shut down. And if you go to Canadian Tire now, it's very, very difficult to buy an A lamp for your house. And if you're like me, you care about the quality of light, you probably have dimmers on your walls. And putting a compact fluorescent through a dimmer doesn't work too well. <laughs> and, even, and even if it's an LED, there's a pair of things that an LED doesn't do that tungsten does. And it's about color spectrum, color quality, color correlation, blah, 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 blah. So, but like it or not, the technology is getting cheaper and cheaper. And their, their efficacy, which means how many watts you put in for how many lumens you get out, is just getting greater and greater and greater. And we have to learn how to tame these things before uh, it's just forced upon us by legislators saying that you will deal with ugly, ugly white light. Um, so, and there's, there's education happening, but I am a big fan of this same tungsten because there's a lot of reasons why tungsten is still the most appealing thing. And I think it goes beyond the fact that I grew up with it, and it's just what I'm used to seeing. There's a lot of stuff. And this discussion will talk about some of the things we try to do at the control level to make this solid state technology look more like a, a hot um, So, Apart from the fact that the technology is available and it's getting brighter, is you know why do we start using, uh, choosing LEDs? Well, the first thing is added the color mixing. The first LED built was red, and then they built the green. And uh, in my career, they actually built blue, and that's when it became red, green, blue, and that's where you get oh, kinetics and then the influx of the blue. So the first thing you do is you have one fixture which can give you any color you want. And um, I worked at the CBC in Toronto, and our big Studio 40 had a site that went 270 degrees, and it was about 300 feet long, and it was 40 feet high. And when we built that, we used strand iris uh, 
1.5K, and we had two colors on the top and two colors on the bottom. And when I did shows like Mr. Dress Up and stuff like that, that had a blue site that would look like a sky in the background, we would change the blue gel every day on hundreds of feet of site. It was very expensive and very hot because the iris unit was massively inefficient and you had to shoot this big site and you were burning through gel, you were taking most of that heat and just absorbing it with the gel and throwing it out. LEDs are great because instead of having four units to light eight feet of sight, you can have one and it can do any color in the rainbow and you can get it like that. So additive color mixing from one picture is one of the great reasons of doing it. Low energy consumption, you can just imagine the HVAC costs in a studio. Like Van and I were uh, just last month at Cinegear Expo in Hollywood and in here one of the hottest places in the States. You got these huge buildings with big dark roofs, and you're just putting thousands and thousands and thousands of watts of electricity into there, and you have to then suck it out with air conditioning. So, with uh, the lower energy consumption, uh, go up and see the, the Altman site that uh, Tim Bachman brought up at breakfast this morning. You know, that one guy, you can plug, I don't know, about eight or ten of those things into a single 15 amp circuit and light 40 feet of sight and get any color you want and never buy gel and never have a guy on the ladder which is a, a different discussion um, much much longer life LEDs uh, are now if they are using the proper control system and you're not driving them to snot will last uh, most colors will last 50,000 hours where some theatrical lamps might give you 400 hours. You know, and discharge lamps that are moving lights will start being completely green and ugly at 400 hours. And they'll cost you 250 bucks. So 50,000 hour lifespan on an LED is, uh, is kind of like you buy a fixture and you never change the color, which is, is very good. Um, the improved physical robustness, meaning you take a light and uh, take it over. Because of the, you know, you're not worried about, uh, I mean, you wouldn't do that with a VL5, you know, because with a, with a hot box of mixture, it just would just blow up. Why don't you do a little Dan Rhodes? <laughs> I miss that. The Dan Rhodes in the five. Yeah. Um, smaller size, I mean, look at the size of that thing. It's not, uh, Brightest light in the world, but it's really small. Uh, and then when you compare that open psych unit, which was this big, compared to four iris units, uh, this big and made of the Zimian pounds. Um, faster switching, no inertia. So um, this can be a good thing and a bad thing, you'll see in a minute. But if you want red now, you can get red now. You don't have to wait for the film to heat up, and then you don't have to wait for it to cool off and you want to turn it off. So, and with that, you can do really cool things like strobing effects. You can do that's color switching, you can synchronize to HGTV if you can properly, discuss that later. Mm -hmm. um, and easier, cheaper installation. That, that is the primary reason why we are living with these things for a long time. Is because when you're building a theater, or when, you, when, you, when I was building theaters you know, in the late 80s, the Strand, you would have, first off, a dimmer room. Just think about that when you're building a blueprint of a building. That is a huge expense. And it has its own HVAC system to pump the heat out of it. And then you have these incredibly heavy, incredibly expensive, dedicated, high-density dimmer racks with big 12-gauge wires going off of these big um, trays that go out. And if you're lucky, they'd be trays, because if you're in Chicago, you can only have them in condiments. So we had 18,000 condiments coming out of this one box. And then, they would go off to these very expensive aluminum extruded things called plug-in strips. And then you would have tails that hang down. And all of that would cost thousands and thousands of dollars and you don't even have a light yet. Then you gotta go out and buy the light and plug it in and then jump. These things plug into a power strip which has a projector and a console and a desk and everything <coughs> else and I have no worry that I'm ever going to trip the tower strip and I can probably plug in five more. And um, 
basically I just feed it DMX. There's no HVAC costs. There's no separate room. There's nothing. So that, I heard this argument first from audio guys. They said, you know, uh, line arrays came out, and you, you basically feed them AC power and a three pin XLR, and you just have this incredibly great sound. But I mean, remember the days, you used to have amp rooms and amp stacks and JBL uh, speakers with crown amps and all the rest of it. And big soca pets came over and out to it. All that stuff's gone. And dimmers, if you're making dimmers today, you've got a very limited lifespan because, you know, there's productions now being lit completely with LEDs. It's not a dimmer in the building. So uh, it's way cheaper. If you're outfitting a, uh, uh, a high school or a church, today you wouldn't even think about it. What, what Brian, again, did 15 years ago, which was to take the, the dimmer and put it in the, in the building, in the, in, the, in the venue with the IPS dimmer strings, saying you don't need a dimmer room, there's less cable and all the rest of it. Well, even that's gone away now because it's just basically AC and so, um, then you think, why not LED? Well, uh, although it's red, green, blue, you, you think you can get every color in the world out of it, but you really can't. They're very narrow band emitters, and you can't, uh, you can't get uh, the full spectrum across of it. We'll talk about this thing called CRI, Color Rendering Index. Um, and tungsten is great because if you look at a CRI curve of tungsten, it's a flat line, it's a like ruler flat. So basically, that means that if you if uh, if you have a red chip and an amber chip, and a, they actually use seven, I think, and, and there's, a, there's another one now that uses like 21. But you can do this with your eye doctor, and he asks you to take all the chips and put them in the right order, and they put a, a tungsten light on that because it's producing white light and it's producing. It, it bounces off red almost as much as it bounces off blue or almost as much as it bounces off other colors. And it comes back to you that way. And with fluorescent lights, with LEDs, with discharge lamps, that's not the case because they're very spiky. So they inherently have a green or they inherently have a blue. So they are going to show the blues and the greens more. So that is a problem with LEDs. Uh, <clears throat> then there's the problem of inconsistency. Um, one LED is not going to light the stage, so you need lots and lots and lots of them. Even this little thing, we call it a pancake light, because it's just a circuit board that's got lots of LEDs on it. Um, so you have the problem that uh, when you are putting all these LEDs on the board, uh, hopefully they all come from the same manufacturer, hopefully they're all manufactured the same day with the same chemicals and the same 45 gallon drums, but not always the case. So you might say, this is a red but this one is a little bit more red. So that's what we call thinning. I'll talk about that a bit later. And then the other problem is over time, and we're getting better at this, but original drivers of LEDs, they would just basically take a power supply, an LED, and a, and a resistor, and just drive the snot out of it. And it would just, over time, go past LED and, and lose its, its color and, and start shifting in the color spectrum all over the place. Nowadays, we try to control them with better better power supplies and better pulse width modulation and we kind of shed them down. It's kind of like a dimmer on the wall. You know, if, if, if an A lamp in there is supposed to last um, a thousand hours, if you dim it down to 90%, it will last 4,000 hours. And if you dim it down to 80%, it will last like 10,000 hours. And if you dim it down below 70%, it will last forever. There's a, somebody in a fire hall in Chicago, I think, has a tungsten lamp that's not burning at its full rate, it's been burning for a hundred years. So tungsten lamps will burn a long, long time. Longer than 100 years? 112 currently, but it's it's a 60 watt lamp burning at 7 watts. There you go. <laughs> Was it Chicago? Uh, that I don't remember. I use it as a teaching example showing how you, when you dim a light it can last forever. Yeah. They actually have a webcam you can go and see. <laughs> oh! <laughs> I, I thought it, I thought it was one of the looking at the top of Whistler, Edison right? batch in Menlo Park. It was, and that's what makes it so cool, and that's why they're preserving it. But it's a 60 watt lamp, or I think it's actually 63 is what it's rated for, burning at seven watts. They've got it dimmed down that far. They use it as a security light for the fire hall, <laughs> so you can see when you walk in the door, basically. And, and there's one. The, the, there's also one in Menlo Park. Yeah. That's one of the originals. 
that is very cool. So when, when the VLX, which is using this big thing, says it's good for 50,000 hours, that's 50,000 hours before it starts to shift color. The thing will last forever, literally. So this solid state technology is, you know, way better than the The other one is difficult to, call, difficult to call me. Um, because these are a pancake plant, I call them, and there's a whole bunch of them to get it bright enough so you can see it. It's very difficult to build an optical system around that will actually put it into a beam that can go any sort of distance to get to the stage. So that's quite tricky, and many, many lights are just doing this by just adding more of them and putting a, a little lens on top of them. Other people have taken it much further. The VLX is a great example, because if you look inside of it, they use a, a, a seven light pipes that are um, crazy shape and crazy internal reflections and hard glass and all that. And they really, really, really thought about how to take what is essentially a wafer that has a 180 degree spread when you just turn it on and bring it down into something that you can control. And it's not just one wafer, even though there's seven in there, there's actually red, green, blue, and amber, or white, but it's white X. So you have to then homogenize that so that you're not seeing you know, shadows of different colors. You're seeing the mixed line of it. And it's very tricky. And, and, uh, and very light has done an awesome job with the VLX. Um, the other thing is you need fans, almost, not always, but if you don't cool an LED, it's like a Pentium chip, your computer. If you take the fan off your Pentium, it, it will shut itself down before it kills itself. But LEDs, unless they have the smarts in there, they don't do that, and they'll just burn up. So uh, to get them in the smaller size, uh, without having a huge heat sink on it, you probably add fans. And then this whole idea of having a dimmer room starts to look like a good idea where it has its own cooling system away from the stage. Because, um, it's not even the audio guys now that cry about fans. I, I, just, I was just in, uh, in England about uh, a month ago, and uh, I went and saw the musical once. You guys all read about that? But, um, Natasha Katz. Uh, lit that, and it's just tungsten lights. There's a couple of moving source cores and revolutions, but uh, not a single fan in there. And it's amazing because it is so quiet. And then that brings in that whole idea of, uh, of being in the presence of others watching the performance. You really feel because you can hear the lady with her damn rapper opening up the thing beside you because it's not drowned out by the ambient noise of all the fans. And that's a very interesting musical because there's no orchestra. The musicians are the performers. So they carry guitars and, and play it. So, so sound was a big, big, big deal in that musical. And for that choice, they chose no lights that had fans whatsoever. So it's very, very odd to have a show nowadays that's not using some sort of automation. Um, there we go. This was a built point in the last slide, but fast switching, no inertia. There's a real problem with that when you turn off a mixed rig of tungsten and LEDs. So if you hit the blackout button, you know, all of a sudden, all the LEDs, like, instantaneously are gone. It's kind of like when LED truck lights came on the back of uh, brake lights for trucks. Uh, you know, you, you noticed it. You know, the guy who put on the brakes, and all of a sudden it was like, red, like right there. And it's so, it, it, almost all of them are already neat now. Um, but when you actually then pulled up beside an old Cadillac and the guy put on the brakes, you would see the brake light. <laughs> and it's just that friendlier thing, you know? And, and uh, you know, the truck will, it's just in your face. And uh, in my house, I have um, not just dimmers on the wall, but I actually have a, a like, sense of, um, or something. Some product we, we built at a, a, a company in Dallas that I worked at. And it's really neat because when you come into the room and you say, you turn on the lights, there's like a one second, two second fade. And it just sort of welcomes you in to the room versus flicking on a fluorescent light, which is like bang. And it's a subtle thing that nobody really puts into words. But when you walk into a room and the lights just go, you know, it just feels much nicer. And that's what one of the reasons we like tungsten so much in the theater. Because, you know, the girl walks on stage and she eliminates. It's not like she walks on stage and just slaps on the face. 
So, no inertia is a real problem, but it can be overcome by good control systems. Um, and the other thing is the servicing of the, uh, the um, LEDs may flicker when you're using them with the cameras, and specifically, you can see them with an iPhone camera. If you take a color kinetics color blast and you put it on the wall, and then you look at your phone, you'll actually see scan lines up on the TV. Because, Dave, you can help me out here, but how, how often is the pulse width modulation on like a crappy thing? Is it like 400 hertz or No, less like? than that. You, you can get it down as low as some of the commercial stuff. Very, as low as like 130 hertz on and off. And they, wow. they, you know, it's, yeah, it's getting pretty low. So but, it's, they, but the ideal, uh, LEDs can reliably be PWM'd up to 3,000 hertz. Right. And, uh, you know, it depends on the control system, how, how fast it can process the, yeah. the, the information to, to drive the LEDs at whatever frequency. But, but yeah, we're starting to find out that 800 hertz is kind of a sweet spot. Okay. Yeah, for, for, I think the VLX is 2K. Yeah. yeah. So what we're talking about is pulse width modulation, PWM. And an LED can't be dimmed. Um, it's either on or it's off. It's a transistor. That's a diode. Um, it's either on or it's off. So to make it look not as bright as it is, is you basically turn it off for a little bit of time. And um, so so what you if you if you obviously if you just turn it off once a second and then turn it on, it would be light dark, light dark. What they do is they start squeezing that cycle down really, really close, and it's called pulse width modulation. So an LED at 50%, this is not running, but will be off half the time and on half the time. And if you only do that 140 times a second, your eye fills in the scan lines because, uh, like when you look at television in the old days, it, you know, uh, it was just doing that at 60 hertz, but um, or 30 frames a second, you, you kind of fill in those gaps. But when you do it with another TV, then you get these scan lines and stuff. So when, when LEDs first came out, uh, they were trying to use them in television and they just couldn't at all. And then when they got HD, it was even worse. So that now they actually are doing drivers that pulse width modulate them at, they say, 800 times a second, which makes it much smoother. So, um, and then the last bullet point here is difficult to control. The rest of the slides will kind of describe why it's difficult to control. And besides control, there's other factors that we have to think about with LEDs. Are they the right choice? And this can happen. Um, you ask. <laughs> so what's happening here is you have a you have a, a red LED and, and you're getting multiple shadows. So and this is quite evident if you bring up a your hand very close to it, you can actually see that. Right? Now, if you go further away, I'll just go further away. I hear the magic man. The rolling lights are a lot better at this. I was going to say, you wouldn't see that problem. I own 20 bucks now. So, um, what is it about control that's tricky? And, uh, and I, I started by saying it was RGB, and then and then they added amber, and, and it's just when you have all of these colors, it's just it becomes quite daunting very quickly, especially if you're trying to do one fixture on red, green, blue, white, amber. You know, you've used up five handles there, and, and basically you've got white light out. Where with a park hand, it's like bring it up, take it down. So, so it, it becomes tricky when you have all these things. And you have to think about, is it better the, the smartness of trying to get white light out of a color mixing light or a nice teal out of a color mixing light? Is that smartness done right here or, or here? <laughs> or is it actually done in the firmware of the head and how it decides to drive the LEDs? And, and, and sometimes that might be the case. You know, there's, there's some LEDs where you can actually take a, I think it's not LED, but I know um, Morpheus color figures, which use color mixing, would say, you know, 1% would be Roscoe 1. 26% you know, would be Roscoe 26. You know, and and, and they, they had these tables. And all of the smarts and all of the tables and all the data and all the thinking about it was done right in the head um, and not done up here at all. 
And sometimes that's a good idea and sometimes it's not. And we'll talk about why if uh, Roscoe colors sort of go chrome chroma typically through the, the, the spectrum numerically. But other ones, you know, like uh, GAN and stuff like that, you know, the number that is one greater than the last number might be a completely different shape. Mm -hmm. And if you did that in the head and then you did this, you would get a whole rainbow of colors happening. <laughs> You know, it's not useful. At that point, it would be better to think about controlling. Um, and the other one is, is if the smarts are being up, done up here, is the stuff going down this wire going fast enough that with that zero inertia problem that we talked about a lot, you're not seeing steppiness on the lights. And uh, because there's absolutely no inertia in an LED, you can't. You know, if, if the data says go to this level or go to this level, especially between about 15% and 0%, you can see that like, on stage very, very clearly. So you have to think about how we're going to smooth that out. And some people have done a great job again. Um, I sound like I still work for very late, but I don't. But very late did that with their moving heads way better than anybody else because you could send almost any crappy DMX signal to it and the lights would always move smoothly and like that, full stuff. Because they did all this internal damping and inertia, like, kind of like putting shock absorbers on the motors that control the pan tilt, but done it in software. And they would do all of that really, really well. So when you started the very light moving, it would kind of ramp up, move across, and then you would tell it to stop, and it would go, okay, so. Um, and, and there's people um, that, that when they first did LED lights, they said, oh, well, DMX is 8 bit, that's good enough. But 8 bit down at the low percentage levels when there's no inertia, you can see that step clear as day. So that's a problem. Um, so when they when they do act like that, they look nothing like a tungsten light. Or when you do hit the blackout button, they turn off immediately, and half the rig is black, and half of it is fading out smoothly. So now you have a mixed rig of tungsten and, and LEDs, and, and you can tell that they're not from the same. Design elements that are fighting each other um, at your peril. Um, and then just because you can do it doesn't mean you have to. Um, and uh, and I'll show you an example of, of, you know, of a, a seven-channel uh, LED light that says, "Hey, there's all of these different ways to control it." And we're not going to decide what's best for you because you know better, so we're going to give them all to you. And then you're left holding the bag, trying to figure out how to control everything. So that's not my philosophy. So this is an example of an LED wash light. This light does not pan and tilt. It does stroke, if you look at channel 5 there. Um, but it uh, is pretty much a replacement for a car cam. It doesn't zoom. Doesn't do anything special. And this is, out of the manual, how to control a light that is essentially you're supposed to turn on and turn off. So, out of that, they have five major modes of operation that you have to choose from before you begin. So, do you want it to be an RGB or studio mode? I don't even know what studio mode is. Studio seems like they, they have color temperature, but you can't control color. Um, so there's 14 DMX slots that it will take up in the footprint. So as soon as you got one of these things, you've used up 14 handles. Um, a lot of them in different modes are not even applicable. It says it right there. Never mind. Don't worry about it. We never thought about it. Um, a lot of them are optional. So in a mode of operation, you plug it in and you say, well, when you're in HSI mode, you know, you can use this channel 8 to juice up this thing, but you probably won't because you don't understand what it does. Or it's difficult to see. Um, in my humble opinion, there is only three that are useful. And that would be hue, saturation, and intensity. And the rest of it should be figured out by computers. Because when you start doing the math, um, where do I do that now? Oh, yeah, I do it here. So, there's other additional features. So, there's a 
you know, fan control if it has a fan. And if the fan is going to come on, is it going to come on the same volume all the time? Or is it going to come on on demand? Or is it never going to change volume because it's more annoying to hear a fan go off? You ever sit in, a, in an auditorium and you're listening and you're listening and then all of a sudden the, the air conditioning turns off? Mm -hmm. You notice it more when it turns off than when it turns on. Because when it turns on, you're like, oh, it's annoying. But when it turns off, you're like, oh, give me more of that. You know? So sometimes there's there's options to say, yes, we need the fans, otherwise the lights can't be that bright. So just leave them on all the time. And other times they're like, you know what, I don't care how dim it is, don't turn the fan off because this is a, 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 a string quartet. You know, it doesn't scroll. Is it a standalone book? You don't even need the ads. You know, just put it up and it will start lighting up the disco. You know, it has a microphone on it, so it will just go to the beat of music. This thing is studio mode, which is, you know, calibrated color across them. There's Master Slave, where you don't have a guest, but you actually hook them up together. Uh, color matching is the one where they actually calibrate the colors, and they look at them, and they govern the top end, so that everybody is as bad as the worst light. Um, correlated color temperature, which we'll talk about. Hey, I don't even understand that one. So when you start adding it up, there's five major modes of operation. Then there's console, standalone, master slave, focus. So you multiply five by five, you get 25. Then there's three different fan modes on this light. So you multiply 25 by three, you get 75. Then the pulse, the strobe, the curves, the redshift, the data loss, pulse width modulation. So that's that thing that Dave and I were talking about. You can change what it is for HDTV or regular TV or whatever it is. So there's 43,000 different ways of essentially setting the dip switches on this light that you're supposed to be able to turn on and maybe change it. So, this was our choice before. You know, right, green, there we go. And you stick it in your front. And you put it on a wheel. <laughs> we could. <laughs> and this is, a, this is a simple choice now when it's red, green, blue. So let's talk about some of those problems that I mentioned earlier, bullet points. Uh, binning is the, uh, the issue where I said, on a day where the guy assembles it in the factory, he literally, I showed you a picture earlier today, of our park bins when you're building the cognitos. Literally, somebody has a bin of blues and they populate them, or a machine populates them on a circuit board. So there's a blue bin, there's a red bin, there's a green bin. So, is this blue exactly the same as this blue? Is it exactly 453 nanometers? Not likely. You know, at, depending on what temperature it's at, depending on you know, the mood of the guy when they built it, the chemicals they put into it, all the rest of it. So what they do in manufacturing is they realize that, they're, that you're not going to get everything completely lined up. So you will specify for your fixture to the guy who makes the LEDs, I will buy blues from you, plus or minus four nanometers, or plus or minus three nanometers. And when you go from plus or minus five nanometers, eight nanometers down to plus or minus two nanometers, it's kind of like getting a light down. It gets exponentially more expensive. Because all they do is they just put them on a test rig and they throw out the bad ones. And what they do is they give the bad ones to, you know, and truck light manufacturers, you know, parking light, so exit signs, uh, you know, stuff like that. And and the people who really care, maybe the medical profession, but mostly it's us who are most critical. Um, and so so that makes the, the process more expensive. And then they have to do that for for all of the other ones. So let's talk about now control of how it the uh, you look at it. So essentially. You know, we, we look at, this is one method of looking at the color spectrum. This is where you can get, you know, every, this is, although it's a projector, this is, you have to, trust me, on every possible color you can put, you know, the eye can see. So, now it's, how do we get to some point on this little grid or graphic? So, elementary school teachers would tell you in art, 
the, the primary colors are red, green, and blue. And out of that, you can get any color that the sun is emitting. So we pick a point in this area, and we pick the chips that go for that. And the chips that are most commonly used are 540 nanometers, 470 nanometers, and 630 nanometers. And when you have those things, you can imagine by varying the intensity on them, if you turn them all on, you kind of get a white light, right? And if you turn these off, you get blue. And if you turn on the green a bit, you start moving along here. But you can well imagine, you, it'd be difficult to get here. Because, you know, the straightest distance between the point is, is a couple of the straightest. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And you can't really go outside of that. Um, so, uh, when you're looking at it in this spectrum, this is a, this is a visible spectrum, so our reds are over here and our violets are down here. And uh, we have an emitter that will give us a peak here, but it's a bit fuzzy, so some of it will be off here. This, the red guys are always pretty bright. They're very efficient ones. Uh, the green's in the middle of the spectrum, so um, we're only... Uh, Remember doing old projectors where you have three guns and you always uh, align on the green. And then you do the one was to the left of that and one was to the right of that. So um, what you get is the summation of everything that's underneath here. And that's, if it's mixed together nicely, it's kind of like the, do the calculus, right? It's the area under the curve. And this is some goofy looking curve. So, um, so if you're to control these three chips with the control system. Let's take it one step at a time. Let's just say they can be on or off. So you take the red and it's on half the time and it's off half the time. You take the green, it's on half the time and it's off half the time. You take the blue, it's on, 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 on half the time and it's off half the time. So out of that, you will get eight different colors, um, including black, which is here. So that's something you should consider. So two, Eight of two times two times two is eight. So that's how we mix color when we have three color sources. But we don't just say it's on or off. We say it goes from zero to full. So now we have to say 255 times 255, 256 times 256 times 256. Now all of a sudden, what was simply going from zero to full, you have 65 million choices. So, 16 million choices of reading factors. Um, yeah, so 16 million choices to, to essentially find a point on that curve. Up in the middle. Then we decided that the calculus underneath that curve, we weren't getting enough in the ambers. It didn't look enough like tungsten. And somebody came along and said, I think the progression was it was first a red LED, then a green, and then a blue. And the blue is really a white, essentially, technically. I don't know why. Um, and then it came along white. And then they came with amber. And then now they have cyan, and they have deep red, and they have various other ones. So what they did was they said, we're missing out on this area here. And almost all of our theater lights live in this area. So that's why our LEDs were always looking harsh and more natural and um, you know, sterile compared to this beautiful tungsten. And this is, you know, this is a, a great example of, you know, looking at answers under tungsten. Like this is sort of, these are my hands being green, but it looks natural and, and pretty. Um, so what they did is they added an amber LED at 580 nanometers. And now this locus in the middle, this area that we can hit on this curve has grown a little bit. So now we can reach those areas. So that was done by pushing up a pipe. And now we have more area under the curve here. Right? And it's, it's interesting that the, you know, this, this spike, just because it has a steep slope, it does give you a, a big area under the curve, as does you know, this one's giving us more and more and more. And what happens when you have really bright lights, really bright LEDs, is these peaks become higher. So then you end up getting more of the curve between the two. It might be steep, 
But in essence, you do get more of an overlap between them. So bigger, brighter LEDs will actually give you an apparent ability to get to more color. So now, when we went from 16 million, we add another 255 to that, and we all of a sudden have 4 billion combinations to get the color right out there. Wait, there's more! You can take um, and add in, like I said, the Celador fixtures have a cyan, and they have a deep red, and uh, violet. Maybe a violet over here, right? So what they're doing is they're pushing this locus out trying to get to more area of the curve. And with seven yeah. LEDs, you have 256 times that seven times, which is 72 bazillion gillion. <laughs> and then you're thinking, do I want to control that from up here? <laughs> <laughs> and you're thinking, I think it's time that the manufacturer deals with that down in the head. And they are best at knowing how to hit a point when I give them. So now, having direct control of all of the LEDs is not the right choice to control. Although they give it to you as an option five. So, so the option is, you know, you've got one emitter or you've got seven, which takes you from one, you know, Essentially, 255 different options of intensity to 72 gazillion trillion billion. So, talking about some of the things now that we can do intelligently up at the control end, not necessarily down with pulse width modulation and hitting a point of the curve down there, which I'm hoping that more and more people do down there and let us do what we think about playing and control up here. Um, in the old days, we just had intensity. But if you had um, like a Hog 2 desk or, or any you know, Strand 500 desk or something in the early days, when you added an LED light onto the console, they would say, well, you've got color attributes there. You've got red, green, and blue. Go nuts. But color attributes, they act in the way we call when you're, when you're running queues. They work in the last action and they don't work highest because highest doesn't make any more sense when you're talking about color as it does in pan tilt. Like a, a pan of 65% is not more important than a pan of 35%. So when they do fading, they will actually take the last instruction they have and go for it. But when you're mixing submasters and intensities, you basically, like if, if a light is recorded in this one at a percentage and in this one at a percentage, when you bring it up, the way that we resolve and code here is we take the highest guy. Because obviously you want it, you, you put it there, you probably want it that bright, even if somebody else is driving it. So that is um, a thing about uh, intensity, but if you had a grandmaster on a straight 500 desk or an obsession or any hog to anybody, and you had a bunch of parkans, you had a bunch of very lights maybe, or siren lights, <coughs> and then you had a bunch of color blocks lighting up the site, and you hit the blackout button, <coughs> all the lights go out except for your site. Because they didn't have an intensity attribute. Because the guys who implemented it in the desk basically said they've asked for red, green, blue, we're going to give them red, green, blue. And red, green, blue don't land on the Grandmaster. Only intensity channels land on the Grandmaster. They didn't take into account that the intensity was implied by the lowest, the, the lowest value of the three red, green, and blue chips. So what we did when we, when we built our desks is we did... We said, I don't care who makes your light, we're giving you an intensity channel. Because essentially what we do is lighting. <laughs> and you think about lighting as, you know, you turn the light on and turn the light off. So if you're not even giving them the control to do that, you're kind of missing the point. So in our natural language control, we said, I don't care if you're a projector or a cyber light or a parkan or an LED light, you are on a light because you're on a lighting board, you get an intensity. So this gives us the ability to do some pretty cool things that other guys haven't been able to do, is you can paint with, say, seven fixtures across that wall. You can paint an interesting rainbowy look, and then take the whole thing and bring it down, or strobe, put an intensity effect on top of that, 
And then you're just dealing with seven intensity channels. You're not dealing with 21 color channels. And you're not changing the picture. You're just changing the level. It seems very fundamental, but um, it really hadn't been done. I don't think until we did it, Marky. I don't think anybody else was. I think the grandma. So, and the other thing that, that I didn't talk about last time, um, I uh, I did this talk at, at On Police Soul Tech, uh, but, but I saw a band demonstrating it just before I started speaking, is these handles we have, and you can play, come up here and play with them later. Um, if you have this up on stage, you would have pretty much an amber. Let's assume this is at zero. So red and green together give you an amber. But if you wanted the light to be blue, and uh, your name was Kelsey. 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 They said, "How do you how do you uh, uh, make blue?" Now she's a theater person. She knows. She says, well, I have to bring up the blue and take down the red and the green. And Dan says, OK, go ahead. So she started by taking up the blue, wheeling it, wheeling it, wheeling it, and got up to here. And she went one more notch. And immediately what she noticed is these two handles started dropping. And she kept asking for blue. And when she was done, these handles came down automatically. So our desk says, if you want blue, you ask for blue, and you'll eventually get blue. So we override it for you. And again, that's really simple, you know, because we have this lady that we actually did meet her once, but her name's Miss McGillicuddy. She's not really real. But it's this fictitious person we have who doesn't do lighting 40 hours a week. She's a school teacher. She teaches yeah. phys ed in the morning and theater arts in the afternoon, right? And she basically, when she's thinking about theater arts, she's thinking about costumes and blocking and stage management. Oh, Lighting, you know. So we tried to make it simple for her, and basically, with a color mixing light, she doesn't know color theory. She doesn't know color theory, but you're not thinking about it when you're trying to get a band to look blue. So we basically say, if you want blue, you ask for blue, and you get blue. You know? And I don't know of another desk that does that. It's just thinking about it up at this end rather than you know, making us. Because that was that was another um, talk I heard which sort of inspired me to come up with this natural language control thing, which is, I was at a Broadway learning master class, and, uh, and I heard an affluent designer, I won't mention her by name, Peggy, um, say, <laughs> uh, <laughs> she said, the first thing she said that just grated on the guy to my left and my right, because all three of us were kind of Broadway uh, programmers, uh, she said, your learning board operator must be a good typist. Mm -hmm. Because she was very much in control. And she just said, I want to say da 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 and didn't want any mistakes. Where this whole thing came out of moving lights and automated control, where us lonely operators became programmers. Because essentially, the designer would say, some designer would say, I, what I want is slashes over there that didn't have the in the floor, ah. blue. And it was our job to translate that into 0 to 255 over 8 quarts of DMX. Right? But we were always thinking about that mechanic in between. And nobody ever um, said that, that, you know, it was done by the, the, um, the guys who wrote the fixture firmware. Like these are really geeky guys that really don't often come up on stage. And they, they, they basically said, well, I need this many channels. And it was the programmer's job to essentially digest that and then, in our head, translate blue over here into 8-bit levels. Um, and it, the second thing that she said is, and the first thing you do when you get a moving light on the show is you've got to break out the manual and that chart I showed you with all of the tables and modes, and you've got to study that and learn it and know it off by heart. Because everybody was controlling lights with just 0 to 255, right? And I said, that is nonsense. Why are we taking the people that are supposed to be creating art for bums in seats and making them do all the math and transmission? If you want a light blue, just ask for it to be blue. We're a computer. We can figure that out for you. 
So that is the essence of, of what we've done with natural language control. And adding an intensity channel ended up being one of the first steps. So then, let's talk about color spaces. There's lots of them, and if you uh, Google image for color spaces, you're going to see like anything that represents a color space. I showed you that picture earlier, and I'm just going to stick with that. There are spheres, cones, toroids, all kinds of different geometric representations My of color spaces. My favorite fruit. Yeah. yeah. You know, so move it towards green. You know, I mean, that's a, that's a color space. It's something you can speak of. Um, we're Real used to working in RGB, but there is also this idea of amber, or amber white, or just white, or red, green, blue, amber, orange, cyan, purple, or violet, which is the cell more pictures. For CMY, it's great. Before LEDs, we all worked with um, dichroic color mixing, um, you know, high-end fixtures, and very light color, and play back key pixels, and it was subtractive color mixing. So you start with white light, and you throw cyan, and it filters that out. You throw them in, in different combinations, you could get almost any color. Um, and the green more often than most. Um, <laughs> or hue, saturation, lumens, hue, saturation, intensity. They're different. Hue, saturation, value. They're different, but they're all valid methods of describing light. So when you have intensity versus value, now remember I said in the chart, my humble opinion, these are the only ones that we really need, intensity, hue, and value. So I'm going to explain why we, on our desk, rarely, if ever, expose the amber chip or the purple chip or the cyan chip. We basically say, we're going to work in RGB or HSB. Um, and we'll let you work in CM1 too, if you're working with those type of lights. But traditionally, what we do and, and this is a, another thing that goes back to the abstract control, is if you had a cyber light, which was color, subtractive color mixing, the protocol was all the flags are out at full. So to get white light, you have to have them all up like this. Berry lights were also CMY subtractive color mixing, but the, the geeks who wrote their firmware said all the flags are out at zero. So immediately, although they were both white lights using a subtractive color mixing system, you couldn't operate them in tandem because one was at full, one was at zero. You had to do it opposite. And then you throw color glass RGB lights into it, and now you have to get red, you got to push up one handle. Where to get red on a cyber light, you got to pull out, pull out one as opposed to push out one. Yeah, you got to push pull up. out. You got to pull out one rather than push up one. Or the other way of thinking about it is you got to push in two. So to get red, you've got to push in magenta and yellow. See, I, I've been doing this for a long time, and it still takes me a minute to think about it. And maybe the reason is, is because I've been working with natural language control for 10 years now. And basically what we say, it doesn't matter what the light is, what the make is, what the model is, what the manufacturer is, what protocol it is. You can grab every kind of light and think of them as tools to put photons on stage so you can entertain people in the seats. So, if you want to work in RGB, fine. We'll do the inversion for you. If you want to work in HSI, great. We'll do the RGB translations for you. So, we think that HSB is, uh, um, oh yeah, the, no, it's, it's value, yeah, okay. So this HSI, or HS intensity or lightness. So if you have no lightness, no light, no intensity, you have black. And no matter how bright the lights are, if you're, this works much better with a camera than it does your eyeballs, but theoretically, you could get it so bright that it completely saturates right up to the top, and you get white light. And that's very true with the camera. If you have red LEDs and you open the iris right up, it's just basically going to be white. It's just going to blow the, the CCD chips of the camera out, and you're going to get white. So you have this, this method of getting any color in the world by changing your hue, which is the definition of color. So that is around this guy here. And the chromaticity is how much color do you have, or are you just going from black to gray to white? So the chromaticity is this axis, and the lightness is, is how much of it you have. So that, that's one way of doing it. But, but I think the idea of 
choosing the color of a light and then making it so bright that it becomes white is confusing. So we settled on one of HSB, the value. And what value does is it essentially cuts this thing in half. This is zero value and this is full value. Chroma or hue. Hue is this and this is saturation. I stole this slide so I didn't put the word chroma there. I would like to put in saturation here. And this is great because in our control system, what you do is you decide, like you do with the park hand, before you hang the park hand, you go and say, I'm going to put a red gel in there. So when I want that guy, I bring it up. And it starts very, very dim, and it gets very bright. And when I'm done, I got a red park hand. So that's what we've decided to do here, is we are using the color space so when you get to full, you have the color. The problem with HSI is there's two ways to get white. So it becomes very confusing that you got white on stage when you told the hue to be at 0%, which should be red. So if you, if you want a red light and you, hit it to, you take it to 0% hue, you would expect the light to come, to come out red. But if you happen to take intensity and bring it up past 50%, it's not going to be red anymore. It's going to start to be pink. So we chose HSV because you can always, when hue is at 0, it is always red. And when saturation is at full, it's always at red. And saturation is the only way to get towards white. And that, when he's saying zero, he actually means zero degrees? Yeah, zero degrees. Not zero percent. Yeah. And that's a whole other discussion about abstract control or natural language, is that, is that we don't pan and tilt in percent. We yeah. pan and tilt in degrees. We don't rotate globos in percent. We rotate them in RPM, or speed. Yeah. And the direction is not below and above 50 percent. For us, it's clockwise and counterclockwise. We don't strobe in percent, we strobe in hertz. Right? So everything is using a word, I mean, the, the actual thing that describes it. And we will figure out how to get it down the wire and make the light. And it doesn't matter what the light is. But I mean, today it could be a, a Martin picture, and tomorrow it will be a road day. But, and, but the, second, <laughs> the secondary issue of having two ways to get white is that if you want to fade from white to another color, depending on which way you got white, the, the path of the fade is going to look different. So you need to be cautious of, of using HSI because you may you may get unpredictable results depending on how you got to white. I described that in a moment. Yeah. So we've added we, we well, used, sorry. So HSI is basically tinting, adding white to a pigment. Or non-pigment, sorry, in this case saturation or color. Right? Well this, the, the saturation the hue is the definition of color. Yes. Is it red or is it amber? Yeah. And uh, it says chroma here, but I like the word saturation. How much of that do you have compared to white? Right. When the, when the addition of white to a color is pink, right? At least in my No, it is with pink, I'm not sure the light. You may be right. Okay. Because in the other, sorry, there was like the picture of the cone earlier, and that's, it looked like it was the illustration of tinting, I guess. Yeah, because you're adding white to it, and it kind of comes to that kind of top. Right. Right. So what you guys have done is basically chop it off and. Yeah. It's not perfect. Yeah. Okay, wait, wait. Yeah. That may so help me understand that cell and that tint that I didn't okay. understand the studio. Yeah. Because earlier it said tint, and I wasn't sure, like, when he said, like, I'm not sure what that means. And I don't know what it means in light either. Yeah. I'm just curious. It's, it's tint, long tint long. may also be delta UV. It, well, it's it's the same principle as um, as subtractive uh, subtractive mixing in, in, with incandescent light that, to, that the the tint value just implied that the gel had had more clear space and less pigment. Right. And if you think about if you think about where you're going with saturation that way. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I see. Now, now you, if you think about it, we used to call that range in traditional lighting theory shade to tint. Okay. And then hue was hue was uh, no hue was. Was sh was shade to tint and value was uh, shadow to to, to to white. If you go back to Oren Parker, yeah, yeah. I'm just verifying that it's damn complicated. With the chart, is the guy who used to work for Roscoe. Yeah. <laughs> The, uh, the deal I said is that, that in, in our control system, we, uh, we really don't care about make model protocol. 
we work in this natural language where we fade literally from so many hertz to so many hertz. And then that number have to go up or down or jump or be 16 bit or 8 bit or whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. So it's not a grid of numbers where you're just going from one thing to another thing. So we offer you the ability to work in the RGB color space or in an HSB color space. So I'm just a little demonstration here about how you can work inside of this color gamut of all the possible areas that we can reach. So we're going to do three times Q1 and Q2. And Q1 is amber, and Q2 is red-ish. Um, so when you work in the RGB color space, the straightest, the most direct path between two points is a straight line. So when you go from Q1 to Q2, you actually are, at this point, if your distance from here to here is X, and here to here is X as well, the same amount of tangent. Uh, when you're in the middle here, you're actually closer to the center. So what you're ending up doing is you're going from one color to another color, and you're going to go through a path on the way there, and you may be getting a desirable color, and you may not be getting a desirable color. And it depends which color space you're working. So to exemplify this, and I probably should add a couple more slides here, but if you went from amber to purple on the way through, you're going to go right through the white. And that is quite often not moving the story forward on stage. <laughs> but the important thing about our business is it's not necessarily about where the light lands, it's how you got there that really matters, right? We care about timing and fading and, and and movement of light as opposed to just the, the end destination. Where in architectural lighting, you care that the lights came on, but yeah. we don't really care how you get there. Well, except the, except in architectural display, you actually yeah. care about the, about the transition as yeah. well, the composition as well. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, I didn't write the, the Q, but I can do it in control. So, if, uh, If we're, if we're in this green, I'm just using this on the color picker, and we're going to blue, um, you end up going through cyan, but you could also end up going through white. And that is white, by the way. It's not a robot, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so now, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you If you're working in our natural language control and you're not fading in RGB, you're, which is what the light is expecting to see, but you actually fade in HSB, what you're doing is you have a saturated color of this and the same saturation here, um, and all you're doing is fading the hue. So now, every point along that line is going to be equidistant uh, in, the, in this axis, which is the which is the amount of, of light. So now when we go from red, or sorry, we go from amber to red over 10 seconds, what you see is a pretty natural or as smooth as possible transition that goes from Q1 to Q2, which is probably helping the story along because it's not distracting from what's happening on stage. It's just getting you from point A to point B in a sensible way. But there is the possibility we still have Q1, which is amber, and Q2, which is red. It's exactly the same influence, but you can get there in a completely different way using a different color space. Now what we've done here is we've done an alternate color space. If you forget the lines on top of the, of the round circle, they look almost the same. There's that one, and there's that one. But let's look at it closely. Here, cyan is at 12 o'clock, and uh, purple is at 3 o'clock. If you look at this one here, purple is at 9 o'clock. So still the same two cues, still the same two endpoints, but it's how we're going to get from one to the other. So now let's run the next sequence. We're starting in our amber, and we're going to go on Q2. to go through the disco rainbow. <laughs> and you get to red. But that's rather distracting. <laughs> Unless 
you're doing a dance number. <laughs> Maybe exactly what you want. But, um, at the end of this, if we have time, we're done talking about color. I'll set this up again and show you how we do this with pan tilt. And we, uh, when you pan and tilt it like, because they work on a on a two point axis, it's it's, it's polar. The light sits here. You tilt out, and then you pan around like that. That's not nice on stage. What would be much nicer on stage is if you worked like a follow spot, and you essentially went from point A to point B in a straight line. And you can appreciate it. that is tricky for a light to do that is built on that sort of system. But I can show you that. So pretty good demo. Robert, isn't that something that you were getting towards when, when you were working with CAST on the rig? Well, we did this thing, uh, uh, it's what Ted's talking about is I worked uh, with a company called CAST Lighting, we did WYSIWYG, and that was a visualization system, real-time visualization system. And we had a um, technology called um, autofocus, which um, goes back to that first slide I showed you of Richard Pilgrim's idea uh, thing where the control system and in that environment, you you could have lights hung in like on a truss this way and on a truss that way, and one over here and one over here. And you could basically, because we understood the geometry completely, and we understood the mechanics of how the lights work completely, and the protocol to get from A to B, we did this thing called the reverse kinematics, which is like you study this the kinematics. So if you want to move this foot over there, you bend this, do this, do that. And we could figure all that stuff out in pretty much real time. So we would pick a point on stage with a mouse in 3D, and we would say, okay, what's the best method of getting that light, that light, that light, that light, that light to that point? And with moving heads, there's always two options because you can flip the light. So we would do some logic of where it was, where it was going, and all the rest of it. And then we could take, like we did the judo awards, and I had like 300 moving heads. And I could take all of them and throw them downstage center and click on the nose. But the track would be virtually straight to the What? And then if I kept my finger on the nose and I started moving it, then you would have all of these lights moving in a pod going across like that. Program that. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> well, I can show you on this how you can do essentially that. You still have to pan tilt every single light to get it there. But that would be, I call it stage left, and then do it all again, stage right. And then if you ran it in a normal DMX fade, where you're actually just fading the 8-bit values, what you do is all the lights leave that point, they go out with arcs, they, some go off into the orchestra pit, some go up on the site, they all come over, some get there, well, they all get there at the same time, but apparently, depending on their azimtopic, the, the, the arc, uh, um, I used the wrong word there, uh, like if this if this light is here and it's doing a linear fade, it will apparently move slower. But when it's tangentially further away, every little tick here is a bigger tick on stage. So some will appear to get there faster, although they all arrive at the same point. But they'll all separate. With our desk, basically you put them here, you put them there, and you say I want you to move in this space, and they all move in a dot across the stage like this. It's a great demo when you have multiple lights. Because you can go, and then you can put that on handle, and you can literally follow somebody. Front light, back light, side lights. And they all stay on top of each other from the beginning of the queue to the end of the queue, and they're all on the same spot. Well, as an example, when, uh, when I was working at Shaw, we got our first VL1 games, and we were running them on the Span 500 series console. Basically, the very second day we had the lights in the air, um, the lighting assistant, who's a brilliant guy, um, came along and said, okay, I have to put tape on the lights because I need to know where the top is and where the bottom yeah. is, where the left-hand side is and where the right-hand side is. And we had to cue them in order to make sure that they would be taking the correct path to go where they needed to move. And it was just, at first we're all like, you know, we just bought these things and they can stick the tape off. They were one case? Yeah, they were one case. Yeah, you know what's more fun? Is the shutter control on everything. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah, there's yeah. nine motors to control the four shutters. We had macros that we built that was, um, you know, select the lamp and then push the macro button and you get just shutter A or just shutter one and you could move it in parallel or you could do shutter one and shutter two. It was all writing 
command line for you. So you can just push one button and you get you know, 0.72 and 0.73 at the same time moving. So you can make squares and groups that were made of shapes, the rush angles and squares and inverted squares and long rectangle, tall rectangle, all just to make it easier to move. You should try this. <laughs> this has nothing to do with my presentation, but we decided instead of calling them order 1A and 1B and 3A and 3B to get top and bottom, we decided to call them top, bottom, left, and right. And then you can just go and um, push them in and move them around the way you want, like you would with a normal decode. And it's even better because on a normal decode, um, most of you people know, but my sister would know. Uh, if you wanted to bring in the top shutter cut, you actually reach underneath the light and bring in the light. With us, the top is the top. Again, we will do that inversion for you. you know, because we're smart. We're a computer. We can do this stuff fast. You know, so, yeah, so this is this is how you control lights with abstract control uh, versus over 3A and 3B to get the top. Oh, no, the bottom. No, the left shutter. Uh, bring that one in. <coughs> And then you know you try to bring in it's straight. You gotta grab two channels and bring them in at the same time. After you check the tape on the top of it. We're smarter than that because we pan and tilt in degrees, and when the thing is sitting down, it's at zero zero. So if you got a tilt of a positive tilt, then we already know which one the top is. So. All right. So. <laughs> okay. So, Gary touched on this earlier, and um, there are lights now that use seven LEDs, and um, they have built inside of them the, the tables and the math and the computer to decide what is the best way to get this color on stage. The but the the brightest and most pure version of the color they want. How do we mix all these channels to get there? And um, so you can run the light in uh, RGB mode. So even though there's seven channels, they'll say, just feed us three, right, green and blue, because we understand that. Or feed us HSI. Um, and the, the, the problem is with HSI, when you are doing it with Somebody else's console, not ours. Um, but if you tell the head to listen to HSI, and you define uh, a cue that's red and a cue that is um, uh, amber, I've shown you that there's two ways to get to that, depending on the value of Q. So if you have, um, let's just do it with handles here. If you have this being your hue, and this is the red that you pick, and then this is the amber, when you fade DMX, you're going to go from 50% to say full. Because that's what you do. When you're at 50 and you need to get to full, you go in that direction. But if the red you define is actually at zero, um, and, uh, and then you say, let's start fading, it's going to go from 50% down, and it's going to go through all those crazy colors to get there. And that's all a DMX desk can do. A DMX desk cannot fade, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 5, 10%. They'll never do that. If you ask them to go from one level to the other level, they're always going to go through 50%. So your definition of what it's going to look like on stage is predetermined by the firmware in the head. You will go through crazy colors if you're going from red, which is at 0%, to a sort of red or an amber at 90%. You're going to go through the entire rainbow. And if you decide to run your show that way, you, before you write your first cue, you set up RDM or whatever it is, your lights to run in that mode, you're stuck. Because if you want to go from a, a color that is defined at 10% <coughs> to a color at 90%, you're going to see alien sunrises all the time. <laughs> just a nice transition. Just a lot of color. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so my suggestion when you are saddled with a light with seven chips and they offer you to run it in RGB mode, 
even though you'll run in that straight line version instead of the archy version, which we offer, um, it's better because when you're going from one color to another color, it's going to be like doing a, a normal sort of, you know, couple, like you would see with a color blast and an NSI desk. You're going to get that sort of transition, which is better than Alien Sunrises through crazy colors. So, and the other deal is, is that when when you run it in their RGB mode versus running it in direct seven channel mode, is you're not faced with the 72 bazillion trillion trillion options. Basically, you have red, green, blue, and you could probably use the tools that most of us have on desk now, which is a color picker, and they will decide what is the brightest, most efficient method of getting to that color. Um, and even though you think RGB is not the way to go because most of my rate is CMY, most desks will now allow you to pick colors in CMY, right? Even HSV. But at the end of the wire, the end of the day, what's going on in the wire is red, green, blue, and then they figure out how to take those three into seven. Um, and then I talked about the alien sunrises. Now, some of the other inherent things that happen with uh, with RGB lights is uh, is the, the resolution I talked about earlier about the inertia, and uh, more and more lights you're seeing are actually coming out with 16-bit color control. So uh, two DMX slots are used for red, two are used for green, two are used for blue, and that's just easily represented here. I actually realized I did this picture wrong. It doesn't go to here. It kind of goes from black to full blue, and there's so many steps in between. But if you double the DMX protocol and use two slots instead of one, then the, the lines become so fine that you really don't see it. So then most DMX desks send new values down this wire uh, about 30 times a second. Uh, the maximum is 41 times a second. Um, most little microcomputers on these things can't deal with it that fast. They fall over the cough and produce crazy colors. So, uh, that's why on this desk and many desks you'll actually see the speedy DMX. But again, in the very low percentages, you can actually see those steps if they're just 255 steps. So what people are doing now is they're using 16-bit values and at 30 times a second, it's pretty smooth. But if they were smart, they would do other things like what I would call putting in shock absorbers to the system. And this is that discussion I said earlier with the very light. If you took a, a very light in the old days and you took an early Martin fixture, not nowadays, but an early Martin fixture, when they said the pan tilt is this and the pan tilt is that, I mean, there was absolutely no software shock, shock, or shock absorbers in there, and it would just go, Argh! and because it, the fixture itself weighs something, it would then do this on the truss. Where very light would say, yeah, yeah, I know you asked me to move. But I'm not going to move for the first step or the second. Okay, I'm going to wait till the third one is. And then I understand which direction you're going in. And I understand the sort of speed you're going. Because I can calculate how long it was between those steps. And I can see that you're moving very quickly or very slowly. And then they ramp up the motors. And they start going towards that trajectory. And then they see the value stopping. And they don't stop right away. They say, I'm going to slow down. So, and that's why sometimes they just you know, correct themselves a little bit at the end. But that's stuff that can be done in the software. Um, and I believe our 1008 LED driver? Yeah. It yeah. does that, right? Yeah. So and another way of doing it is that you can take in an 8 bit value and you can super sample it to 16. So even though the protocol says it's 8, because 16 million colors is a lot of colors. You really don't need. You know, uh, 16 billion. So what you can do is the, the computer inside can say, okay, even though he's going from this DMX to this DMX, I'm going to give him four in between, or ten in between. Right, because if the LED is pulse width modulating at 800 hertz and the DMX is at 40 hertz, you have a, a bit of time there before you're going to get the next packet. So you might as well fade between those DMX packets. Um, oh, wow, we're just going down. And the other one is the amber drift, which is when a tungsten lamp uh, cools off, it's funny, we say it gets cool, but cool light is blue. What happens when it cools off, it actually goes red. So even if you have like a sort of daylight blue gel in it, and it goes down at the end, it is actually quite red. 
So that is something you can do uh, with software is you can, when you're taking the light towards black, what you can do is you can just retard the red chips a little bit to let the other chips go down and then, then bring the red chip down last. And uh, so that's something that you could do in the head to make it look more like tungsten. And then the other one is calibration. I mentioned this earlier. What you do is you, you bin all the lights, and Barry Light does this in the factory, where they, um, they actually put a snoot on it, a spectrometer, and they actually look at how red can we get, how blue can we get, how green can we get. And they add up everybody, and they say, well, he's the poor boy today, so everybody is in line with him. So they, 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 calibrate, they pull down the top level, and then all the lights are, are going to give you and this is very important when you got 20 lights across the site and you ask them all to go out with some color and you don't want varying colors. Oh my goodness, then this, I don't have time for this, but correlated color temperature, there's a black body radiator, so that's a theoretical black body that no matter how much light you point at it, it will never reflect light back. So if it starts getting hot, you know that you're only getting the light coming from it because if you looked at it when it wasn't hot, it would just be a black hole. It's a theoretical thing, it's called black body radiator. And as you sort of start heating this thing up, literally, like charcoal and fire, it starts going from red, which we associate with candlelight, and then it starts getting brighter to like a household lamp, and then it gets even hotter, whiter, it becomes more like a tungsten theatrical lamp, and then it looks like a discharge lamp or a fall spot, or LEDs, and then there's this level that looks like uh, looking up into the sky at noon, which is this, uh, 28,000 28, Kelvin. And Kelvin is, a, is, is the same as the Celsius scale. scale it's just offset by 272. So if you, if you take minus 272, that is zero Kelvin. And that's where molecules stop moving. But as they heat up, they actually start giving off photons because some get hot, and then they jump down, and then they get off the um, and we deal with correlated color temperature in a way where we still say this is how you're defining the color, but when you add all the chips together, you get white, and the white you get is at 3200 Kelvin, or is it 5600 Kelvin? And there's a tweaker on our control system that is not in percent, it's in Kelvin. So when you turn on a light and you don't add color, what flavor of white is it? Is it 3200? Does it look like your tungsten fixtures? Or is it 5600 and it looks like your, your follow spot? Or is it some other number? And then you can go and add color in on top of that. So that's, that's what correlated color temperature is. So again, what's the score? And, and one of the ways of summarizing this, I think, is it depends if you want to get a, one of these things. <laughs> So you can do it the old way, or you can do it the new way. But uh, the problem is, is how you how you going to do that efficiently without uh, becoming a mathematician or clever? And I think it's half past. So I'm going to shut up. <laughs>